Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings a message of hope in Jesus Christ. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, because that's what our text is going to talk about this morning, our Bibles, all right? So let's take our Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible, we want to get you one. Uh, if you don't have one, we use the English Standard Version in case you're uh, wondering. That's the Bible that we uh, typically read from on our ten- Sunday mornings together, and it's the one I study from, and I, and I commend it to you if you are in search of a Bible, uh, the ESV is a good one. If you don't have one and you're unable to get one, we'll get one for you. Just go to the starting point desk. If we don't have them in stock right now, uh, we'll get your name, we'll get you a Bible. All right? So we're going to look at our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to John chapter 16, and uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through 15. We began this portion of our study of John back in chapter 14, and we, re- we refer to it as the upper room discourse. Now, chapter 17 is going, to, is going to be a new section, it's going, that's referred to as the high priestly prayer. Uh, but these final verses in chapter 16 uh, are like a summarizing bridge between the two sections, uh, from his final discourse to his final prayer. Now last week, our text ended with a clear description of how the Holy Spirit works among us, convicting us of our sins, showing us what true righteousness really looks like by pointing us to Christ and then warning us of the judgment to come. Well, this morning, Jesus continues this disclosure of the Holy Spirit's work by telling these disciples that just as he has been with them, teaching them, instructing them, so will the Holy Spirit continue this uh, once he's gone from them. Now, in these four verses that we're going to look at this morning, Jesus is going to tell these men that though he has instructed them with many truths, there's still much to learn. And uh, more than the brief time that he has been afforded uh, to reveal. So, let's go ahead and jump right into our text this morning. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot be bear them now. Uh, Even though Jesus had taught them the significant doctrines of the new covenant, you got to think about it, all the things that he talked about. He's been with them uh, this three years now as he's been traveling with them, ministering with them. You have to know that there 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 were quiet moments where he was just with his disciples giving them specific things. Even though he's taught them the very significant doctrines of the new te- of the new covenant that his death and his resurrection would inaugurate, there's still many, many more things for him uh, to teach them. Uh, don't miss the gravity of this. Uh, pause there and look at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Because think about it. This night is going to be the most climactic evening in history. Not just for these disciples. For the entire creation, for every generation, this one night that John is telling us about that occurred in this moment is going to be the most climactic event that history has ever known, and it's about to accelerate. For the disciples, this evening began as a typical meal, an annual evening of thanksgiving and worship. But for Jesus, it's game time. And this is his last chance to get these fishermen ready. Now, as they make their way through Jerusalem toward the garden, Jesus has almost finished his discourse. In fact, with only just a few more words to say, what's left is only going to take two, maybe three more minutes, 22 verses from here until the end of the chapter. 
and he'll be through and then we'll be listening in as he kneels in the garden praying his final prayer on their behalf time is expiring and the things that are still to be revealed cannot be because other things that they are dependent upon have not yet occurred imagine it let me think about it for just a minute the image of the cross put yourself in the disciples position in the disciples place as the evening unfolds as the morning light begins to, to, to shine imagine the image of Christ on the cross him hanging bloody and beaten shamed in the most public way possible no way that he can describe the meaning of that behind it not yet he's been giving them a snapshot of the work of the Holy Spirit what he'll do with and through and for them but no way they can grasp what will take place in Acts chapter 2 no way they can imagine tongues of fire resting on them and then going out to preach the good news to the very people who had threatened his life who would by then have been the very ones who went through with it no way they can make sense of this at this point he's talked about the lost sheep of Israel but no way are these men ready at this point to accept Gentiles into the fellowship of grace. They're not ready for it. So when Jesus says, I still have many more things to say to you, he's telling them there's more to come. And that's significant. And here's why, verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are yet to come. Have you ever heard someone say that they like Jesus, they like what he said, they like what he did, but they don't like the people that came after him so much? Have you ever heard anybody say that? They, like the, they don't like Paul. They don't like Peter. They like the red letters, the things that Jesus is quoted as having said. Well, when Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, he's telling them that the later revelation, the revelation that's going to be given in the form of the, in the book of Acts, in the epistles, the book of Revelation, he's telling them that it's going to be his work. Not the work of men, because there is, now listen, there is no division of God's revealed truth. It begins with Genesis in the beginning and it ends with Revelation, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. It is a great error to say that there is a gospel according to Paul that is somehow different from the gospel according to Christ. Or different from the gospel according to Peter. Listen when I say, there is no gospel according to Paul apart from Christ. There is no gospel according to Peter or James or John apart from Christ. There is one gospel truth and Jesus is all of it. And there are no brand new truths in the epistles. It's the same truth clarified and amplified. There's one theme, Jesus, one source, the Holy Spirit, and one instrument, the apostles. These men were unable, not because they are simple-minded, they're unable, they're incapable of thinking all of this up on their own. Jesus was departing so it would be the work of the Holy Spirit to communicate these teachings and then to guide them through all the truth. Notice at verse 13 it says, look, he will declare, that word there is anaangelos. It's two words. Angelos and Anna. Angelos means message. Anna means back. Anna, Angelos. Now think about it. Here's what it means. The Holy Spirit will bring back to you, Anna, Angelos, the one and same message of truth. In other words, he's not going to teach you something new. He's going to bring back to you that which is already. It wasn't their brilliance. It was the Holy Spirit of God that brought this to them. Peter would later say in his epistle, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
That word for carried along is the same word used in Acts 27 to describe how the ship was driven in the current on Paul's final missionary journey. I was heard a great illustration uh, when I was studying through this of how if, you ever, if you've ever taught or to put a little toddler on a bicycle, have you ever seen that? You know, they'll get the little toddler and they'll put it on the bicycle and, the, and you'll ride along with it. This, that little toddler ain't riding that bike. You're riding that bike. He's on the bike, but you're guiding it along. You're carrying it along. Okay, that's what it means when it says carry it along. The whole, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing and how he used the apostles to write the scriptures. They were the boat and the Holy Spirit carried them along. Notice also it says he will declare this message, look, to you. Don't be confused here. Who is he speaking to? He will declare this message to you. Jesus is not saying that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. He is not referring to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit whereby the Holy Spirit lights up our attention to the text. He does do that. But that's another text that, see, that teaches that. That's not what's happening here. When Jesus says he will declare to you, he's speaking specifically to these 11 guys, to the apostles. Peter, John. He's speaking to the men who are qualified by the apostles, James, Mark, and Luke. He's speaking to that one who would come later and was both appointed by Christ and qualified by the other apostles, Paul. Now listen when I say this. Just because, now listen, just because some new guy comes along and thinks he has a word doesn't mean he does. In fact, he doesn't. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion, followed a vision of what he thought was the prophet Moroni appearing to him as an angel. And he followed him, or he was told rather, where the golden plates were kept so that he could find another testament of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormon. That was not a prophet of God. There is no third testament. And every, and now listen, every televangelist that begins their sentences with God told, God told me, false. There is no rev new revelation that hasn't already been revealed. The book, of Reve the book ended, this book ended with revelation. If God tells us, it's because the Holy Spirit has brought to our remembrance what has already been written. Now this was a big issue for me when I first came to Cleveland, Tennessee back in 1995. Uh, I grew up in a faith tradition that was very uh, focused on uh, what we would call manifestation gifts. And one of those gifts was what we, what we referred to as um, a, uh, a word of knowledge. Now, I wasn't active in this gifting. I wasn't actively participating in it, but I had no problem with it. As far as I was concerned, that made perfect sense. God speaks to us today. He's actively speaking new things to us, depending on our circumstances. I hadn't been at Westwood long, I was a student at Lee, and I was going through my studies there, and I was coming to church. Sharon and I and the kids were coming to church here at Westwood, and, and I had not come on staff yet at that point. I was sitting on a Wednesday night. I was at the old Peerless Road uh, building. If you remember, some of you remember that orange, nice, beautiful orange decor that we had <laughs> over there. And, uh, and I was sitting on the second row. I, I remember it just like it was yesterday. I was sitting in this. It was a Wednesday night. The choir had been dismissed. Cheryl had gone on to choir. The kids were in doing their children's thing. And I was sitting there by myself in the second row. And Brother Bob, Brother Bob Bell was preaching. And he knew I had an issue with this. He knew I had a misunderstanding with this. And he came around, and I'll never forget it. It was like, you know, those of you who remember Brother Bob, he, he had a somewhat of a direct demeanor. Would you say that's true, Ann? I would say that's probably true. Uh, 
he was on the other side, on the organ side, all right? And I'm sitting over toward the piano side. He's on the organ side, and he starts to make this point. And as he makes this point, he reads the scripture verbatim in his head. He quotes it, and this is the quote. He says, everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book, and he looks right at me. (laughs) And what I heard him say couldn't have come across any clearer. If anybody takes away or adds to this book, let him be accursed. Because there's one book and it's complete. I want to be very, very clear here. The scriptures are complete. There is no new revelation. The further revelation that Jesus is speaking of here came to the apostles. It was compiled by the church and it was canonized to be complete. 66 books, not 67. 39 writers, maybe 40, depending on who wrote Hebrews. Origen says God only knows. And that's it. No one else, now listen, no one else gets to write the autobiography of God. No one else gets to write his words. If anyone says that they have a new revelation from God, burn the book, unplug the TV, get out of there, and run. Just because someone says they have a word from God doesn't matter. Just because someone has an opinion about God doesn't matter. The apostles have died. The canon is closed. God crimped the ends of the book and he welded it shut. And everything that can be known about God has been revealed and it is sufficient. Period. We have everything we need to know about morality, about spirituality, about ethics, about salvation, about angels, about end times, ad infinitum. And it's right here in this book. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. And if you didn't clap, you don't believe, and shame upon you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Verse 14. Verse 14. He will glorify me. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So listen, the work of the Holy Spirit and the focus of the New Testament, and this is important for us to get to, the work of the Holy Spirit, the focus of the New Testament, is to glorify Jesus Christ. It is not to draw attention to the Holy Spirit. It's not to draw attention to you and me. It's to glorify Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the source. The apostles are the instrument. And Jesus is the theme. Every book points to his perfection. Every book points to his sufficiency, his atoning work, his grace, his mercy, his obedience, his glory. And the list goes on. The work of the Holy Spirit guiding these men in all truth is to show forth Christ. To show his power, his holiness, his love. And in doing so, cause him to be known and glorified among the nations. Verse 15. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit serves the mission of Jesus. Just as Jesus served the will of the Father. And so the Trinity acts in perfect unity, unified in purpose and mission. And this is our mission also, to take the saving message of Jesus to the hostile world that killed him. And when we do, we'll face the certainty of hostilities and persecution, and that's what awaits these men. But they won't be alone. They'll have a helper. They'll have a comforter. And they'll have a guide who's going to teach them, who's going to witness through them, and who's going to give confirmation to their message as the attorney and judge in the world and who will guide them authentically in all truth so they can leave for us a book. So what do we take away from our text this morning? Let me try to give you a few summarizing points. Number one, We are people of the book because the Bible is the full revelation of God. 
here, the goal of being a Christian is not to try and focus in on some kind of mystic encounter or to discover methods for being a success in life. That, that's, that's not the goal of what it means to be a Christian, is to become a better husband or to be a better, better uh, a spouse or, or a, a better father or a better employee. That, that's, that's not the goal. All those things are, all those things are, 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 pro, are results of being a Christian, but that, that's not the goal of the Christian life. The goal is not to discover how to fit God into our lives. The goal is to discover God in his revelation of himself. That's, that's the goal of what we want to do. We, we want to discover God in his revelation of himself. The landscape of our culture, the landscape that our culture is striving to embrace is value free. Uh, you don't have to be on any kind of media or of any kind long to figure it out. It's, it's to have a life, an existence that's value free. It'll forbid nothing and it will punish everything. Every day there seems to be a new proclamation of perfect nonsense. <laughs> when nothing is wrong and everything's right. One statistic by Barna Research found, and listen, found that one in seven Americans believe America would be better off without the Bible. When you turn away from the Bible, what, what are you left with? Moral chaos. It doesn't matter what New York Times says. It doesn't matter what ridiculous token propaganda Hollywood forces on us. The truth about immorality cannot be changed by spurious genetic research or by the propaganda of special interests. Some things are wrong no matter who says they're right and some things are true no matter who says they're false. There is no creed, no council, no word from any pope or priest or pastor, no, prophet, no private prophecy or supposed word from God, no, or any vision or dream or modern day revelation that can overturn, add to, or subtract from the truth of the Bible. The Bible is the only reliable and infallible expression of God's truth. There are far too many so-called prophecies that individuals claimed to have received from the Lord. If someone begins a sentence with God told me, it better line up with what the Bible has already said. It goes back to the question that the serpent asked Eve in the Garden of Eden. You remember the question he asked? Has God indeed spoken? Yes, he has very clearly number two God has revealed to us the truth not just what is true but the truth and he has preserved it for us now here's another disappointing statistic this one comes from Ligonier Ministries more than now listen you got to hear more than one fourth 27% of evangelical Christians believe that the Bible, just like all the other sacred writings, contain helpful accounts of ancient myths but is not literally true. 27, did you hear the statistic? 20, I'm not talking about 27 Americans, I'm talking about 27 professing evangelical Christians don't believe the Bible's true. We got a problem. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the only way that we can understand this world is to reject the idea that truth is a matter of personal decision, preference, or opinion. And accept the fact that objective truth is necessary for us to have a right and a proper understanding of this world. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. There's some things in this book I don't like. Are they there for you? Because I'm going to tell you, if you can't say yes, you haven't read it. Because there's some stuff in here I don't, I don't like it that people go to hell. I don't like that. 
But just because I don't like it doesn't mean that I can create another narrative that goes against it and, and solves the problem. The psalmist said it this way. He said, the sum of your word is truth. You hear that? The sum of your, all of it is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Paul told Timothy, he said, do your best to present to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. You see, the revelation of God in Scripture didn't come to us from these men. That's the thing we can learn from this text. If there's one thing we can draw from it, the revelation of God didn't come from Peter, James, and John, or, 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 or Bartholomew, or any of the others that you want to throw into the, grant, into the problem. Christianity, in fact, is not the religion of the apostles. It's not the religion of Peter, or Paul, or John, or Billy Graham, or John MacArthur, or Charles Spurgeon. Christianity is the religion of God. Revealed to us in the life of Christ, and given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in a book. And there is no parallel to it in all of history. It is the God-breathed message from the Father of his son, by his spirit, and through his apostles. It is therefore absolutely authoritative in everything it says. Every word is absolutely true. It doesn't, now listen, it doesn't contain truth. It is truth. Number three. The Bible doesn't save us. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save. But where do you find the gospel? You're not going to find it on Dr. Phil or Oprah. You can't find it by looking at nature and tracing the flow of history. You don't find it by smoking peyote and eating mushrooms or staring at the clouds. You can't get the gospel that way. Where has God put the gospel? He put the gospel in his book and he gives us the capacity to understand it. The reformers used a word, a term called perpiscuity when it came to this issue. Perpiscuity. They meant that while there are many things in the Bible that remain obscure, even to the greatest scholars, God has made the way of salvation so plain that anyone from the least to the greatest can understand it. The Bible reveals to us that God is the creator of all that is and that his nature is good and wise and loving. But above all, it insists that his nature is holy with all the implications of preserving his holiness. It reveals to us what his righteousness is, that it's the standard of heaven, the absolute righteousness of God that requires absolute Righteousness, which by the way, none of us has kept, none of us can boast of. We're all in that boat of failure when it comes to that. We've all failed and we've all fallen short. The Bible tells us that. This is the conundrum. And it's the conundrum that we cannot figure out on our own. How do sinful people somehow enter into the presence of a holy God who will not compromise his holiness. How does this happen? It's a conundrum. There's no explanation. Not on our own. Because we need God to reveal to us what the solution is. Now at this point, you have to imagine the disciples would have answered that question by saying, well, we know how that happens. It happens through the sacrifices. But that was only given to appease the wrath of God for our sin. The sacrifices didn't offer a final resolve for sinful men and women. They only gave a temporary solution and it had to be repeated over and over again. But that's how they would have answered the question then. Which goes back to what Jesus is saying. I can't tell you everything right now because you don't have it all. 
But the Holy Spirit's going to come after some things have happened and he's going to reveal all this to you and it's all going to make sense. But at this point, they're thinking, hey, I can't enter into the kingdom of God because I haven't sacrificed. Get a lamb. So the question remains. How can a perfect God allow imperfect people into heaven? Here's the answer. He won't. He won't. If these men had been left to figure out this on their own, they may have reasoned it this way. They may have said, well, we'll, we'll, he'll just let everybody in. He'll just forgive everybody. That's called universal salvation or universalism, and it's a heresy. It's wrong. If they had been left on their own, if the Holy Spirit had not come and led them in the truth, that's where the church would be today. We'd all be universalists. Or... He'll just punish everybody. He'll just send everybody to hell. No. That would be just. But he wouldn't show his mercy. So how, do you see the dilemma that these disciples would have been in on this night? When considering what it is they would have done after Jesus had been gone if the Holy Spirit had not come and given them the truth? It's a riddle. How can God punish me and still declare me innocent? How can a merciful God fulfill the obligation of divine justice? No way these disciples are ready to hear the solution of this. They can't, they can't take it. They need the Holy Spirit to be with them after the cross, after the resurrection, after the ascension to reveal the answer to these things. God gave the Holy Spirit to pull the covers back, to convict us of our sin, to show us the righteousness of Christ and then warn us of the judgment that awaits us so that we could turn to Christ in faith and be reconciled to God under his terms, not ours. And he gave us, he did it through by giving us the book. So here's your application for today. Do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Do you believe that the Bible is God-breathed so that it's truth and truth alone and truth without any mixture of error? Do you believe that the Bible reveals the message of salvation through Jesus Christ? Do you believe that the Bible is able to thoroughly equip you in every way to live a life that's pleasing to God? Listen, if you believe those things, here's your application. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. If you believe those things, take this book and put it into your heart, put it inside where you can never lose it. If you believe those things, take the message of the gospel which is in this book and let's go out from here and let's go tell somebody. Right? If you don't believe these things or you're struggling with doubting more than believing. And I've told you before, this was my dad's problem. For probably 74 years of his 79 year life. He couldn't wrap his mind around this idea that men wrote the Bible. You're not alone if you're struggling with doubt. You're not alone if you're having a hard time believing this. But can I urge you, if that's you and you're struggling, don't go to the New York Times bestseller list. Don't go to the podcast of some popular preacher. Go here. Go to the Gospel of John. You want to know how some people say, well, how, what, how can I read the Bible? Let me, let me tell you. Go to, go to John. The Gospel of John. Start there. Take your time. You know, it's not a race. You're reading to learn. You're reading to see. Let God speak to you through his word. Take the Gospel of John. Then when you finish the Gospel of John, go to 1 John. Go all the way back to the back. 1 John. 2 John. 3 John. 
You finish John's gospels and epi- gospel and epistles, go to James. Stay with the J's. Go to James. Read the book of James. And then when you finish James, you're probably familiar enough right at that point, you probably can find your way from there. If you can't, give me a call. I'll gladly give you the next book to read, all right? Start in the Gospel of John. Don't go to some other source. If you want the answer, go to the source. If I want to know somebody, something about somebody, I'm going to ask that person. Or I'm going to ask the person that knows them best. Go to the book. If you're here this morning and you're living without the confidence of knowing Christ as your Savior, if you couldn't say with certainty that you're a Christian, that you're a follower of Christ, can I tell you what this book says? It says that you were intended to be the crown of God's creation, created in His image. to live in peace with him forever. But we forfeited that right and we offended him with our sin and this brought grief to God. And for it, we have brought upon ourselves the due penalty of our sin, which is eternal separation from him. But God is merciful. He's given us his son, Jesus, and he paid the ultimate penalty on our behalf by dying on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. The penalty of death was not his to pay. This book says that God did not send his son to us to condemn us, but that through him we might be saved because he paid that penalty for us and he offers it to all. Friend, you can be saved today. Simply trust what Christ has done. Trust that he did it for you. And accept this as your only hope. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. You'll be saved. You know why I know so sure? You know why I said? Why I know? Why I can say with such certainty and confidence? Because this book says so. And there's enough credibility upon it that I trust it. Have you seen this, the words of this book in your life, working in your life? Has this book changed your life? These are the words of the Holy Spirit given to us as a testimony of Jesus Christ. This book is paper and ink, but it is the very truths and the wor- truth and the words of life that brings refreshment to our soul and new life to our mortal bodies. May Christ be glorified in our love for it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this book. We thank you for your word that you have so graciously given us, that you've not left us without a way to you, that you've not sat in your heaven quiet and distant from us, but you have, have spoken to us the very God who fashioned our bodies and and brought life into into our souls is the very one who has spoken to us. And you did it. You did it through your word, through your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that we'll never take that for granted. I pray that this book, this book will be upon us in a way that we find life and truth in it as we read it. And I pray as we do, Father, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate it to us, God, so that we see and find new things within it that we never realized before and that testify to your goodness, to your love, to your mercy, to your wisdom, to your kindness, and so forth and so on, Lord. Thank you. Father, be merciful to us. Forgive our doubt. Be patient with us, Father, I pray. We're listening to a lot of voices out there. And every one of those voices is saying, this book's a lie, it's a fable, it's a fairy tale, but we know better, God. Strengthen our faith, Lord, I pray. Help us to remain true and faithful to the words of this book. To cling to Christ as it tells us to do, as our only hope for salvation. And Father, for the one who's here, 
continues to struggle, who's so struggling, wanting to, wanting to believe, but, but doubts are still there. Lord, I pray that you would show them mercy, patience, and bring to them the voice of reason, the voice of facts that speak true of this book. Draw them close to you, I pray. Draw us all, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.